you, everyone. And we are excited, um, as a guest of the entire Academy, to have Ahmad, uh, Dr. Ahmad Ansari with us. He comes to us from the um, NYU's Integrated Digital Media Program. What is, what is it's now? Design and Media. Design and Media. And he, where he is an industry assistant professor, he's going to be telling you a lot more about all of uh, his research, a lot of which focuses on decolonizing design. But I wanted to just mention that he's a, he's a founding member of the Decolonizing Design Platform and the Architecture Design Research Lab in Karachi. And I think you'll do a much better job of your introduction, so I'm going to cede it to you. Thank you for being here. So, um, let's see if I can get this up and running. Uh, okay. Okay, good. Uh, so, hi. Um, a couple of things before I launch into my introduction in the lecture. Um, you know, um, given it's, it, we have a kind of nice, sort of intimate audience, a uh, small intimate audience, um, you know, two things. Um, a, I tend to go uh, use a lot of references, so I'm going to use the whiteboard to maybe write reference some references down. Um, things that are not going to be up in the PowerPoint, but you know, if I'm giving a reference to a particular philosopher or anthropologist or critical theorist, I'll write their name down. Also, I do sometimes tend to speak fast, so you feel free to kind of interrupt me and be like, can you slow down and say that again? Um, and I'll try my best to kind of also uh, you know, keep a pace. Um, so with that, uh, thank you all for having me here. Um, it feels kind of like, at the same time, it's, it's a little weird, but it's also, it feels great in a way. Um, this is my first kind of in-person presentation in almost three years. We've been sitting at home, you know, doing Zoom presentations one after another for almost the last two and a half years now. So, it, you know, thank you for, for having me. Um, so, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a, a design studies scholar. And I'll talk about what that means in a little bit. Um, but my background, uh, my undergraduate, was in graphic design and typography. And I kind of minored in film and illustration. And then my graduate education, uh, you know, I have a master's in interaction design um, and a PhD in design studies from Carnegie Mellon. So uh, I, I now teach st both studio courses. So the studio courses that I te teach are in graphic design, in UX design, and in systemic design. Um, and I also teach seminar courses uh, in design research, theory, and history. So when I, when I say that I'm a design studies scholar, um, you know, I, I tend to have a, there, depending on whom you ask, uh, everyone has a, every design studies scholar has a slightly different definition of what they do. Um, you know, design studies being a kind of very uh, sort of, not young, but very kind of like niche uh, sort of di discipline with, you know, uh, so when people ask me, okay, what is a design studies scholar? What do you do? I, I tend to situate my work at the heart of three things. Um, you know, so I, th I think that design studies scholars are primarily people who study and do research on designers and on design. So they are interested in the same kinds of things that designers are interested, like for example, the nature of creative practice. Um, the, you know, uh, their interest in things like materiality and insofar as, you know, and how kind of like designed artifacts and things relate to things like the body, for instance. Right, so they do research on design and designers and they also do research in disciplines that are adjacent to design. So, and the disciplines that I found um, and that I feel like a great many other scholars kind of draw from, design studies scholars draw from, are primarily philosophy, anthropology, and history. So a lot of what I'm gonna reference today comes from these three kinds of fields. My own background, I started out in philosophy of tech, particularly as a kind of Heideggerian scholar. So I studied Heidegger and then I later studied like post-Heideggerian philosophy. So I, I was, you know, this was about like roughly eight, to 10 years ago, I was object-oriented ontology or speculative realism. You know, Graham Harmon's work and Ian Bogos' work was in fashion, and so I kind of like spent uh, that time kind of studying like these post-Heidegger scholars who were actually saying really interesting things about design and art. Um, so I started out as a philosopher, and that is what I see as my principal kind of focus. 
Um, but I also draw a great deal from anthropology, particularly cultural anthropology, because cultural anthropology has a lot to say about difference, cultural difference, racial difference, ethnic difference, so different forms of difference. Um, and that's principally why I draw a lot from, from that particular sort of field, field of study. And then the last thing is history. Um, and I'm particularly, you know, there's, there's, on the one hand, there's design history, but I'm also in, interested in history more generally. As you'll see in a little bit, a lot of my presentation, I'm going to launch into a history of design um, and historicize what I call the decolonial turn in design, right? So, uh, you know, one thing uh, to kind of note is that over the last four to five years, we've, we, the field has been experiencing particularly design research um, you know, design discourse has been changing and shifting. And one of the ways in which it has been changing is that it is now much more common to talk about the politics of design practice, the politics and ethics of design practice, particularly with an in attention to issues of gender, race, and culture. So uh, in a way, I think that it, it's particularly, I think we're at a point now um, you know, five to six years out where we can kind of start doing his, some historicizing, right? We can start putting things into context and sort of situating them as part of this larger shift that has happened in the field as a, at large. And so, um, you know, a lot of what I teach um, and end up talking about and writing about has to do with politics and ethics, research and theory, and design history. I will uh, add before I launch into the lecture proper, that I do believe um, I am a huge proponent for design studies and for design history. I believe that design, there should be more PhD programs and more graduate programs training theorists and historians in design. Um, so, and I have a lot of things to say about graduate education in design, so perhaps we can talk about that later. You know, after the lecture, I'm more than happy to talk about. One of the things that I also do now in relation to this that I probably should have mentioned earlier was that I run the PhD program at, at NYU. So we have a PhD program in technology, culture, and society, uh, you know, and IDM is one of the programs that is kind of responsible for it. So on the, on the, on the integrated design and media side, I, I administer that program. Um, so one of the arguments, there are a couple of arguments. So one of the things that I'm going to do today is I'm going to historicize this movement or this shift that has happened in critical design discourse over the last, particularly over the last five to six years. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the second move that I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, you know, talk about how that historicizing actually feeds into uh, a project that I've been working on for the last about year and a half, almost two years now. So with that, I'll launch into the lecture proper. Now, we are kind of, I think it's important to kind of note that there is a lot of talk around decolonization, right? In the field of design, you have a lot of practitioners, you have a lot of researchers, you have a lot of scholars writing about decolonization, writing about, about from various perspectives. Um, and I'm, we're talking not just about decolonial perspectives, but also perspectives, um, feminist perspectives and feminist epistemologies, as well as drawing a great deal from uh, critical race theory, for example. Um, and I think that one of the things that has really, I think, stuck with me and that has really kind of bothered me, um, this is a really bad kind of, of uh, image. Unfortunately, there were no good images, but I was back home, I wanted to kind of start with this. Um, I was back home in Karachi over winter break recently, um, oh, this December and January. And uh, when I was there, there was the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Pakistan is my hometown. I, I come from Karachi originally. You know, organized a nationally televised symposium. He, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, basically in October last year, he convened this new institutional body, this new governmental body called the Rahmatullah Alameen authority, right? And, you know, the idea behind this body was that there has been, a, globalization has damaged our youth, right? So there has been a lot of harm that has been done because of globalization and because of what Imran Khan deems as Western influences or Westernization. And this, the, he convened this kind of body to kind of undo uh, or to kind of, you know, proselytize uh, and start thinking about what an Islamic state would look like. Now, uh, you know, uh, 
it's Imran Khan's government is not a far right government, but there's something that really kind of, the way that Imran Khan was talking about the kinds of discourses that were kind of circulating in Pakistan, I was very struck by this idea, by, by these statements of his, because a lot of that kind of um, rhetoric and speech was using the term decolonization. So one way to read Imran Khan's sort of like convening of this national body is to kind of read it as a, an attempt to decolonize right, um, Pakistani minds, and particularly the youth, which he feels had been too, too, you know, too westernized. So this particular kind of screen grab came from a televised conference which I was watching. Uh, this happened uh, shortly after I arrived in early January. And I was a little disappointed too because um, you know the conference had a lot of very interesting, it was an I interesting mix of people who fell on all different kinds of the political spectrum. I was a little disappointed actually, um, there's, if, you, if you see the gentleman in the middle kind of like row on the far left, um, you know, uh, Sayyid Hussein Nasser. I was a big fan of Sayyid Hussein Nasser's work. Hussein Nasser is an Islamic studies scholar, so I'll write his name down here. But I was a little, um, you know, dismayed to see that Hussein Nasser was kind of lending his voice and authority as, as, a, as a very globally revered sort of Islamic studies scholar who teaches and resides in the US to essentially um, a very kind of unprogressive political movement, right, that, is, that was happening back home. And there was a lot of criticism to give a little bit more context to this. It really, uh, you know, it's really kind of problematic the way that like the Pakistani state is falling back on religion and on very specific definitions, right? Their own kind of definitions of what an Islam looks, you know, what, what the Islamic uh, religion is about and what, what it kind of like, uh, what its principles are, what its ways of life are and so on and so forth. So there are these really kind of reduced notions of religion that were being used to fuel a kind of religious nationalism. And it's not just, one of the things that I want to point to is I want to situate this at large in the world today. What we're seeing in the world today is the resurgence and rise of nationalisms of various sorts, right? It's happening not only in Pakistan, it's also happening in India under Modi's sort of leadership. It's also happening in Bolsonaro's Brazil, right? It's happening in Europe, right? It's happening in the UK, in the post-Brexit UK. But everywhere around the world, what we are seeing is that uh, discourses around globalization and cosmopolitanism are in retreat, and discourses about ethno-nationalism or religio-nationalism are, are back in fashion. Um, and that there, there are governments that are actually implementing decolonization, schemes for decolonization around the world. But that word has also been used in India and in Brazil, interestingly enough, they, they use. So it's also interesting to note that the right, right? It's, it isn't just the left that utilizes and employs the world, the word, right? It's also the right that has deployed the word. And so this kind of, uh, A, like, uh, it, this really kind of struck me, A, I was watching that back home, um, it was also, it, it kind of like took me back to earlier observations that I had like a couple of years ago where, you know, I, I, I could see that if pushed to a certain extreme, decolonization actually current, has the potential to turn into a form of fascism, right? If, you're, if your definition of culture and if your def is too closed, right? And if your definition of what it means to decolonize kind of hinges on this conception of purity, and purification, cultural purification, then you know th th that word or that concept can very easily lend itself to like far right discourses and extreme forms of nationalism, you know, even fascism. So I really hope that it wouldn't turn out that way. But we're living in the world we're living in. So that kind of led me, um, you know, over the last two years, it, it helped contextualize one of the things that I've been working on, which is historicizing the decolonial turn in design. So like I said, um, over the last particularly four, four or five years, um, and in the US there, are, I think there, there, the fa there are lots of factors for why this has happened, right? 
our last presidency here, as well as various um, social movements, social justice movements like Black Lives Matter, uh, as well as the Me Too movement, um, you know, have kind of led to the discourse of decolonization, to discourses of feminism, and to discourses of sort of, um, of, of racial justice becoming very common in mainstream and design. But I wanted to go kind of further back. I wanted to kind of situate these discourses as part of a longer and larger history. So I'm going to start with, I'm going to quickly lead you guys through this history, um, you know, through a kind of longer chronology about discourse around politics and ethics and design in general. And different scholars, uh, you know, kind of use these word, words in different configurations. Like, for example, uh, you know, uh, the Iranian Scandinavian scholar Mahmoud Keshav tends to use the word design politics uh, instead of the politics and ethics of design. So it's worth noting that these words kind of like, depending on what part of the world and who is speaking, like they tend to be in slightly different configurations. But so what I'm going to present is, is kind of a quick history. Um, so for me, um, you know, the most kind of like the moment where ethics becomes a principal concern for designers, right, traces back to the work of two people in the 1970s. The first is Victor Papanek, who wrote Design for the Real World. Uh, show of hands, maybe, for people who might have read it. Has anyone read Design for the Real World? Yes, OK, good. So um, for those of you who haven't, I really recommend it. It is a highly polemical work, you know, and part of Papanek's kind of uh, motive with the book was to actually jolt the profession, you know, give a hard shock to the system of the profession, of the field, right? Uh, this is, these are, by the way, the opening lines of, of Design for the Real World, which was published first in 1971, the first edition, right? There, are, he literally says, there are professions more harmful than industrial design, but only a very few of them. And possibly only one profession is phonier, which is advertising, right? And he really goes to task, th these are the opening pages of the book, where he really takes to task the disciplines of industrial design and graphic design for A, manufacturing and producing things that are essentially like, you know, that, that don't provide any kind of real lasting tangible benefit, right, but only exist for the, source, for the sake of consumption, right? Um, and, and advertising, he critiques because, you know, in his own words, advertisers sell people things that they felt that they never really needed. But, you know, advertising, advertisers create desire. So in other words, he's pointing to two things. He's pointing to A, capitalist consumption, right, and the kind of huge me mechanisms, the machinery of production that kind of underpins it and makes it possible, uh, you know. And, and then he also talks about the manufacture of desire in, in sort of, which is so essential to like consumption in modern capitalist societies. Um, you know, Papanek has some really kind of, I think, interesting things to also say. It's interesting to, to give a little bit of context and history on Papanek. He spent a great deal of time in Southeast Asia uh, in particular, he traveled around the world. He spent a lot of time in the global south. One of the things that he has to say in Design for the Real World and in his later books as well, particularly The Green Imperative, um, is that uh, he talks about how design should be, you know, the materials used to design anything should be locally sourced, right? So societies should design in accordance with their local ecologies and environments. So he's kind of advocating for a kind of regionalism Right? Early, he's one of the early proponents of a kind of regional, regionally oriented sort of turn towards sustainability. Uh, and then the other thing is that you know, he, he has a great deal to actually, interestingly enough, say, uh, talk about, say about design education, where he points out that like, you know, one of the, if, if we are to talk about a relation between the East and the West, or the North and the South, then the South should be left to develop its own competencies. The North, however, can help the South develop those competencies. Um, but in the opinion of this other gentleman, who is the other person that I wanted to kind of like um, show, uh, Gui Bansiepi, you know, uh, Papanik didn't go quite far enough. Um, and interestingly enough, one of the things that I highly recommend if you haven't encountered his work before is uh, his work is largely out of print, and what does exist used to exist mostly in Spanish. Uh, or you know some aspects of it in German because he was German to begin with. But recently, uh, the disobedience of design, which is a collection of his essays translated in English, was just published. So if you know you could 
uh, it, it actually has a good kind of selection of his work. So uh, Bonsieppi's perspective was slightly different. Again, Bonsieppi was someone who had also widely traveled, particularly he was initially, um, he was associated with a Hochschule for Gestalten Ulm, or the Ulm School in Germany. So I'll write that down. Um, which may or may not actually have links with Cranbrook. I, I've never really thought about this, made that connection before. But like now that I'm here, I'm kind of thinking maybe there's a relation between the Ulm School and, and Cranbrook. So he was, he was uh, associated with the Ulm School. He then later, um, you know, as part of uh, an initiative by the UN, traveled to Chile to work under a Salvador Allende's government. He was one of the people who worked on the CyberSign project. Uh, and he was also, he, he had a short stint in Argentina um, at the invitation of Thomas Maldonado, who was another one of, the, one of the faculty at the Ulm School. So he spent a lot of time in Latin America. And what's interesting about his work is he's one of the, one of the designers who A, kind of really, not only did he spend a lot of time there, he actually kind of mapped, and, his, and, and he's, he's one of the people to kind of create one of the first sort of histories uh, global histories of Latin American design. Um, so Bonsieppi kind of disagrees. This is where Papanek and Bonsieppi kind of disagree. Bonsieppi really studied the kind of political economy of production in Latin America very closely. And one of his kind of like observations was that, uh, you know, that countries in the South or the East should start investing in the kinds of informal economies that already exist. Right? So one of the things that he noticed was that the South, even though within a certain, pers within a certain perspective of development, right, according to development theorists, the South was backwards. Right? It didn't have the kinds of industrial capacities for mass production that the North did. Right? But what Bonsiepi noticed uh, was that the South had a different kind of economy that was very kind of creative and very innovative. He was pointing to kind of not only local craft and artisanship, but he said, you know, one of the observations that he makes is that there are large informal sectors of the technology economy whereby you have people who self are largely self-trained or self-taught and have learned how to kind of like, you know, recreate the, the same kinds of like tools and technologies that you see in the North, or at least adapt them. Interestingly enough, Bonsiepi's work kind of like comes very close to um, you know, I was doing research a couple of years ago on, on practices in India and Pakistan. And interestingly enough, what he has to say about informal sectors of technology production comes very close to what Indian and Pakistani uh, scholars have to say. Like, for example, Ghulam Kibriya, who is a Pakistani sort of um, very little known Pakistani sort of like uh, technology scholar. He's, a, he's essentially like, He's written a kind of history of technology. You know, he has something sim very similar to say where he makes this argument that actually Pakistan and India's strength lie in the kind of informal expertise. You know, these are not people who are trained in design schools or engineering programs, but nevertheless know how to recreate and remanufacture, right? Um, and are very kind of like adept uh, at sort of like uh, what you would call reverse engineering things. And he said that this is a huge sector that is completely unnoticed and un, you know, like uh, the state, you know, Kibria's argument is that he, he actually urges the state to actually strengthen the sector. Um, so both, both of them kind of, they are in a way the first two to kind of talk about there being an ethics of design. So like both Papanek and Bonsieppi kind of argue that like this, their needs, designers need to take responsibility for what they bring into the world. Um, and they are the, you know, in Papanek's case, he, you know, one could read his as an anti-capitalist sort of, his, his articulation of design is an anti-capitalist form of designing. In Bonsieppe's case, he's one of the first people to actually talk about design from the South, what design could be in the South. I wanted very quickly to also point to other discourses. So, um, you know, in the 1990s and in the early 2000s, we have Pat Kirkham and Judy Atfield who are one of the early kind of like scholars to bring sort of like an explicitly feminist sort of like epistemology to 
you know, both the study of design as well as design research. So Atfield, for example, um, wrote Wild Things, which, is, which was also published, republished recently. A lot of these books are out of print, but they, they're beginning to be published again, which is a really good sign, I think, um, you know. Uh, so Atfield was an anthrop, you know, she had a training as an anthropologist. She basically, like Wild Things, uh, which is one of her really good books, is essentially a series of ethnographies and case studies of domestic objects. Um, she also writes a lot about style in design um, and about how like designers' expectations of style almost never conform with. Her big kind of contributions to the field, I think, happen when she points to the fact that like A, designers cannot completely account for all the ways that users will make use of objects. So in other words, use exceeds what the designer imagines, right? Uh, and on the other hand, she talks about style in a similar way too. That like styles and the kind of meaning making that happens, uh, you know, that, that particular styles tend to have, like things go out of fashion, but people still tend to keep hold on to them for various reasons, including like nostalgia. Um, you know, uh, she, she has a lot to say about like sort of like the durability of style. Uh, you know, Pat Kirkham is, is a historian. She's a, she's, she's a design historian and, you know, her, uh, you know, work largely focuses on sort of histories of women designers uh, and sort of reading sort of like everyday produce, mass produced objects in a gendered, you know, the, the gendering of sort of everyday objects. Um, by the way, her book, uh, Women Designers from 1900 to 2000, is uh, available for, f I believe you can download it for free now. So that's another good, it's a nice kind of perk to have. Now, when we come to the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, we begin to see the work of this gentleman, um, uh, you know, Tony Fry and his partner, Anne-Marie Willis, who later ran Design Philosophy Papers, which was a, which was a publication that had a good long run almost about a decade. Uh, you know, Tony Fry's work is particularly important and especially for me. I think that there are two things um, that Fry has to contribute in, to the discussion of politics and ethics. The first is his contribution to the field of the concept of ontological designing. Ontological design and ontological designing, which quite simply put is um, you know, uh, Fry has an interesting history. He's, he's, he also draws a great deal from sort of, sort of Heidegger's philosophy and sort of post-Heideggerian philosophy. So ontological designing is, you know, to put it simply, whatever we design and make uh, and put out there in the world makes and shapes us in turn. So all designing is in essence the designing of the human, right? The artifact for Fry is almost incidental. It is, you know, obviously the designer it focuses on the artifact the most, but the, it is, you know, what is beyond the artifact and what in fact is really being designed beyond the artifact is the human. Um, and it's, I think it's important to kind of like note that for Fry there is no normative human, there is no universal human. There can only be multiple humans, right? So, I, you know, Fry is also one of those people, um, he's one of those scholars who essentially talks about how Design as it stands today is a largely Euro, Anglo and Eurocentric discipline that has a very narrow understanding of the kind of white, of the human as the white male, you know, able-bodied, fit, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, he's, he's one of the, actually, the first people to criticize kind of like Anglo and Eurocentrism in design. So ontological design, which is that whatever you design, designs back the human, is his first concept that I, I, is, is quite important. And I'll come back to that concept later because it, it plays into my work um, you know, in the second half of the presentation. Also, how am I doing for time? We're doing okay, I think. We're yeah, we're doing, we're doing okay. I think we'll be fine. Uh, you know, the other concept is this concept of futuring and defuturing which is essentially um, the, the way that uh, I would explain futuring and defuturing is the moment that you design something and it becomes to be adopted, right? The, the minute that something design enters mainstream use, you've effectively opened up certain potential futures, right? So you, oh, it's almost like opening up a series of doors, right? You've opened potential ways. You've firstly changed the way that people are in the world. 
You've changed the way they do things. You've changed the way that they behave. You've changed indirectly. You've changed their kind of like your, their relation to reality, to the real. Um, but the other thing that you do is you also open up potential other pathways for them to be in the future, right? So there's future in every design futures in the sense that it opens up further socio-technical trajectories, uh, right? Uh, socio-technical being the kind of like conglomeration of like the social and the technological, which both kind of like reinforce each other, right? But it opens up certain socio-technical trajectories and it also opens up future technological trajectories of development. Uh, one person that I would highly recommend if you're interested in trajectories of technology and genealogies of technology um, is also, I, I would mention like the French philosophers have done quite a bit of work on this, but above all Gilbert Simondo's work on uh, geneal genealogies of technology is very useful. So, um, so we future, right, by making things, but we are also simultaneously at the same time defuturing so the minute that you open up certain futures, you have also shut the door on multiple other alternative ways of being in the world. Uh, so this is really important. Every act of futuring by design is simultaneously also an act of defuturing by design. And, and in fact, Fry really focuses on the defuturing bit, uh, particularly his books that focus more so on, on, on issues of sustainment Right? He doesn't use the word sustainability, he uses the word sustainment. They kind of read rather apocalyptically because you know, Fry actually, the way that he frames it is that he frames our present, the pre our present modernity, right? the state in which our societies, in which we live right, globally as inherently unsustainable. And it's, it's a pretty doom and gloom scenario if you ask me in his writing. He's pretty apocalyptic. He, he's very much of the opinion that like if we do not make radical shifts in the ways in which we live, not only in the ways that we, in which we live every day, but also in our larger kind of infrastructures and systems, uh, we will effectively go extinct and sooner rather than later. It's, it's pretty apocalyptic. Um, one of the interesting things though, later on, um, Fry kind of continues this thread. He's done a number of collaborations over, the, over recent years. Um, one of his collaborations was, was with um, Eleni Kalantidou. Um, another was with Arturo Escobar, um, both of which were essentially on issues of decolonization. The book that I would recommend of his if you're interested in what he, it was the edited volume with Eleni Kalantidou was uh, Designing the Borderlands, which is where he essentially tackles the question of decolonization head on. He's got an interview in there with the Latin American decolonial scholar, Walter Mignolo, which is quite worth a read. Also, I hope I'm not going too fast. Everyone's good? Okay, good. Uh, moving on, now we come to the present moment. So we've moved on and I think where the kind of present turn really kind of begins to kick off is with you know, one of the central events that I place is it was, happened in 2010. It was a debate that happened on Design Observer. Well, the whole debate has been documented on Design Observer. It actually happened over several forums, online forums. But it was essentially sparked by Bruce Nussbaum. Bruce Nussbaum wrote this, um, you know, Bruce Nussbaum was, um, you know, was teaching in New York at the time. He wrote this um, piece in Fast Company called, Is Humanitarian Design the New Imperialism? And one of the things that he did was that he, called into question, uh, to give it a little bit of context, 2010 was a year where there was a lot of popular discourse in the field around design for social good. You may have heard that term, design for social innovation, design for social good, and humanitarian design too. And there were several like, um, I would say like firms that were particularly prominent, um, one of them was Project H, which was a firm that was headed by Emily Pilton and her partner. Emily Pilton was an ex-architect who basically quit her professional architecture practice um, and then did projects in Africa and Latin, in South America, as well as in the rural United States. And Bruce Nussbaum, you know, kind of, uh, you know, he was referencing her work in this. Um, but one of the arguments that he makes in that article is he questions you know, from his own experience too, talking to designers in India, for example, 
um, you know, he, he says, you know, should, shouldn't we take a moment now that the movement is gathering speed, he's talking about humanitarian design, to ask whether or not American and European designers are collaborating with the right partners, learning from the best local people, and are as sensitive as they might be to the colonial legacies of the countries they want to do good in. So he's kind of questioning ethically this imperative whereby designers want to go out there, parachute into unfamiliar cultural contexts, and then just do projects. Another example that I might give, and this was a project that again was very prominent in the, around about the same time period, was the One Laptop Per Child project, right, that came out of the MIT Media Lab. Um, and so he asks, you know, why is this such a one-way relationship that is still kind of predicated on these very old sort of like mid early 20th century notions of development, right? Uh, and might not like designers from Brazil or India have something to teach American or European designers? Why do we always assume that, you know, we have to kind of designers sitting here, educated here, uh, have the kind of right and authority to like parachute in and kind of redesign the sort of like uh, technological infrastructures of people who live in completely different parts of the world. Following this, this, by the way, there was a pretty long debate and you can catch the whole debate. It's, it's actually up on Design Observer. So if you want to read the responses, Pilton and Project H gave responses. There were multiple responses from, I would say both, you know, many different sides and the many different perspectives were exchanged. It's a pretty interesting kind of debate. Moving on um, to 2013. Um, 2013, another series of debates was sparked this time around the nature and practice of speculative and critical design. So SCD, to give a little bit of context, um, you know, was, yes? Okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, you know, another set of debates um, in 2013, uh, m the Museum of Modern Art in New York, uh, Paula Antonelli, uh, you know, who was the curator of design over at the, at the MoMA, effectively curated what would be a two year long kind of exhibition slash, you know, which kind of culminated in a symposium, which was also hosted at MIT. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, initiative was called Design and Violence. And, you know, so she had curated um, a, a large number of artifacts, um, a lot of which came from speculative and critical design practice um, and a lot of which uh, actually came from the RCA, which was one of the prominent kind of institutions for that kind of practice at the time. Uh, you know, so, and you know, one of the interesting things was that the exhibition had a website, um, all the artifacts were on display on the website, and they had, es she had commissioned various people to write essays, of, which, of whom John Thackeray was one. So John Thackeray is a design critic and a scholar, um, he is known for his research on sustainability, um, again, looking at various forms of grassroots initiatives and innovations that are happening all across the global south. Um, so John Thackra was asked to write an essay on, on this particular piece, Republic of Salivation, which was by Michael Burton and Michiko Nida. Um, and Republic of Salivation was a project that was essentially, it was a kind of speculative it represented a future where essentially, you know, people were being force-fed. One of the one of the things in the project was people were being force-fed um, soylent-like nutrients. It was supposed to be a commentary on the kind on kind of dystopian futures regarding food. Um, and in you know the the piece generated Thackeray was not very um, forgiving. Um, and he kind of, one of the things that Thackeray did in 2013 was he critiqued, um, so if I go back, he kind of critiques speculative and critical design practice for, his critique was more, far more based on kind of the functionality and SCD, speculative and critical design, being a little out of touch with reality, right? Where, whereas most of the people who then kind of like responded, and this also turned into a big debate, it's also still online, so if you want to catch the debate, you can go to MoMA's website um, on design and violence and, and look at the entire debate. But a couple of arguments were made. Um, one argument being that um, SCD kind of like hides the politics or, or tries to kind of, um, you know, uh, 
polish over the politics with a veneer of aesthetics, right? So one of the critiques that came from Matt Kayyem, who was a PhD student, um, I, I believe at UTS Sydney at the time, um, Matt Kayyem kind of criticized speculative and critical design for kind of trying to do away with the political dimensions uh, and the fact that like all fictions, even design fictions are always politically situated, right? Uh, with a veneer of like, you know, flashy aesthetics. Um, you know, other, other sort of responses came from other parts of the academy. Um, you know, one of the perspectives that was put forth, this is kind of where my own involvement, at the time I was teaching in Karachi and doing work in Karachi, but my own perspective on it was that um, the work was kind of like a little oblivious to its own sort of situ situatedness coming from a, from the global north. You know, the kinds of, my own perspective was that, you know, what the global north considers to be dystopian scenarios are actually lived realities in the global south. Um, and so, you know, this kind of brings into question the whole notion of a fiction, right? And, if, and an imagined future. Um, and so, you know, uh, one of the, this kind of culminated in a debate uh, in 2015 at the Naughty Objects Symposium which Paula kind of curated as the culmination of, of that design and violence exhibition. I was in a debate with Jamer Hunt, which was kind of like an artificial debate because they kind of framed it as human-centered design versus speculative and critical design, which is not really how I wanted to address the issue at all. Um, but, you know, I kind of stood by my, uh, my argument that, you know, critical design's claims to criticality were, were not enough that in fact what you need if you really wanted to have a critical speculative practice of design was to actually account for political dimensions and get into the messy you know, political histories of artifacts and societies. Um, very quickly, and I'm gonna kind of wrap up the history now, from then on, you know, the decolonizing design platform formed in 2016. This was a group of PhD students who, um, were you know, really having a hard time talking about issues uh, related to design politics. Um, and so kind of came together to form a group and uh, launched the website, which was the decolonizing design platform website, and basically said like, if no one will publish you, we will publish you. Um, following around about the same year, a, a couple of more important folks, this is also you know, worth looking up, I think Norm Sheehan's work, Norm Sheehan is an indigenous um, Australian design educator and practitioner. He's been working with Aboriginal communities in Australia for the past two decades. Um, he had ri he's written a great deal on indigenous knowledge and the importance of, desi of designers being able to understand and value indigenous knowledge systems. So his central argument is that the indigenous people of Australia have their own histories, but they also have their own way of making sense of their world. They have their own relations, historical relations to nature, to Australian ecology, Australian ecology and environment, and that there is a lot of value in the kinds of knowledge that other cultures, other than the Anglo-European, have to bring to design practice. And so Sheehan was working on this, on what he calls respectful design, which is essentially respecting the indigenous traditions and knowledge systems. Uh, Dory Tunstall built on his work. So Dory is, was, is, is, dean of, is the dean of OCAD University in Toronto, um, you know, uh, and, and she kind of like built on Sheehan's early work, she does work mostly primarily in the realm of design anthropology. She's a, she's a design anthropologist. Um, 2016 was also the year where the Design Justice Network was launched, um, actually in Detroit. They were at the Allied Media Conference in Detroit in 2016 where they collectively, you know, um, Sasha Costanza Chalk is actually, was one of the principal founders. Um, you know, you might actually want to look up their, their work the, the Design Justice Network, but they essentially kind of created a set of principles, you know, where they espouse that we will only design in, in you know, in the, in the service of more equitable, more just, uh, and so on and so forth, futures, right? So the Design Justice Principles. And then there, in 2017, there was Depatriarchized Design, which was, um, you know, founded by Maya Ober and Nina Pime. 
Um, in 2020, I believe, Depatriarchized Design, uh, Depatriarchized Design, you know, their, their mission as given here was to democratize the access to design education and discourse and empower and amplify the voices of women, BIPOC, LGBTQ, uh, as well as people with disabilities, essentially all of the peoples who had been put to the margins of design practice. Again, like Depatriarchized Design also started as a platform to publish essays that were having difficulties published elsewhere. Um, and I would say that in the last two years, Depatriarchized Design has transformed into uh, Futurus, which is its latest kind of you know, incarnation, um, and now they're publishing all of their essays under the name of Futurus. Lastly, I will say, very important, um, Arturo Escobar published Designs for the Pluriverse in 2018 and brought uh, Latin American decolonial theory to the front and center of kind of critical design discourse. Uh, his book deals, his particular formulation of decolonizing designs is what he calls autonomous design. Um, autonomous design essentially being this idea that designers help facilitate and support the autonomy and the local, the, the autonomy of local peoples, of indigenous peoples, of, of natives, as well as, you know, act, basically you're acting as a facilitator to the interests of local groups and local actors. Um, other interesting things that have happened post-2018 um, with the Black Lives Matter protests, there was a lot of work, I mean, this, this kind of, uh, I could, I could sh show like a great many projects, but I'll just stick to a very few now. We're in the two, we're in roundabout 2020, 2021, so we're kind of standing in the present now. I'd just like to point out to the work that like Ramon Tejada, uh, at, who is at RISD, um, and Silas Monroe, who is in San Francisco, and I believe teaches at CCA. You know, they recently, last year, um, and the uh, last year they kind of la launched BIPOC design history, um, and now they have a second version, Latinx design history. So there's a lot of interesting work that is now being done on historicizing design differently, looking at all the histories that were hitherto invisible. Right? What does design history look like from the perspectives of African Americans, from the perspectives of indigenous peoples, Native Americans? What does design history look like from, the, from Latin American and perspectives in the Caribbean? Um, you know, Leslie Ann Noel and Renata Latau um, formed the special interest group in pluriversal design uh, you know, at DRS as part of the Design Research Society in the UK. So this has become kind of like uh, mainstream, one of the largest research groups in as part of the DRS, which is the single largest kind of institutional body, European institutional body, um, you know, respond, you know, that is kind of in charge for coordinating conferences and other thing, other events around design research, um, you know, both field research and practice-based research, um, and then Louis Sandhouse, who launched the People's Graphic Design Archive in 2020, uh, which is also a kind of a publicly curated, open, open curation kind of like arc, uh, resource. Um, so that, with that, I will say that, um, you know, one of the things that I've been doing, um, apart from like kind of doing this historicizing and putting everything into like a timeline, is I've also been kind of looking at what, how people are speaking about decolonization. And one of the things that I've noticed is that, you know, obviously there's a lot of, you always, you find all of these words, but there are certain things that were missing in the discourse. So I think a lot of my work now has to do with what, what are the ways in which we are not talking about decolonization? What is missing? What perspectives are absent? So, th I mean, the, tr the turn has really opened up a lot of, it's a lot easier to research and do, create scholarship um, particularly on issues of the global south, on marginalized communities. But one thing that I noticed and which continues to kind of, I think, bother me about the state of decolonial discourse is um, there's, again, uh, and it kind of goes back to my initial point, right? In an, in an age where nationalisms are on the rise, certain ideas about things like modernity and culture and difference tend to you know, I, I don't think that it's a coincidence that we particularly, we tend to frame concepts like these in a certain way. And so you have 
decolonial discourse focusing a lot on cultural difference and racial difference and gender difference, but there's very little talk of cosmopolitanism. There's very little talk of transnationalism or of the experiences of immigrants or diasporas or people who don't fall neatly into an identity bracket, right? Um, for example, there's very little in the way of discourses around the stateless uh, as well. And also, you know, one of the things that has really come to kind of bug me and that I, I've recently written about is the how like even categories like the indigenous or the native are politically constructed categories. So I think that there's been some amount of critical reflexivity that has been missing in the decolonial turn. There are things that we are not talking about. And I think that this is, this is really important if we are to actually, it's, it's important that we actually talk about these things because we're beginning to see these discourses of decolonization being co-opted by the right. They're beginning to feed into discourses of, that are national, like extreme forms of nationalism, even borderline fascism. So I, this really worries me, and you know, a part of it, I, I then began kind of tracing not only a history in design, but also a history of what are the dis, where are all these discourses coming from? And I mean, this should be no surprise, but most of the, de, the, the ways in which we think about decolonization and decoloniality come from the Americas. Latin American decolonial theory and critical race theory, you know, most prominently. Um, it's weird how like all of the insights of post-colonial theory on cultural hybridity and syncretism and on globalization and the mixing of cultures and the hybridity of culture, all of that has kind of been lost in the, in the, in the conversations that are happening generally. I mean, another big thing that is also never talked about or mentioned is Marxism. And it's, it's weird because whenever I go back home, there are huge, Marxism has a real, you know, there are huge Marxist move, like Marxist activism is, is, is actually like pretty big in South Asia. But weirdly enough, you never hear any kind of discourse in relation to these movements that have a real pull in the global South. Uh, it kind of like makes me think, you know, we're entering into a different kind of bubble here. So I think that you know, the decolonial turn really needs to talk about, rethink, I think we really need to go back to some core questions, right? And these are core questions that have for decades been debated in other fields, in the social sciences and the humanities. Like there have been decades of, of constant debate over notions of difference in cultural anthropology, right? Is difference shallow or is it deep? Right? When we talk about someone being culturally different, is it just that it's a shallow difference in terms of language and in terms of like how we do things? Or is it a really deep kind of difference that entails a fundamentally different orientation, a different way of being in the world? This is something that has been debated for decades in anthropology and you don't see this in design discourse at all. Right? Similar things in, in, around questions of modernity, like for example, Latin American scholars place modernity at a different time at, at a different origin, point of origin, historically than say post-colonial scholars, right? They have different definitions of what modernity is. So if we can't agree on what modernity is, then you know, wh how can we talk about decolonization? So these are all kinds of questions that I'm exploring. And I'm just gonna go into part two. Uh, and I'm, you know, in the interest of time, because I do wanna leave time for q and A. I think I'll try and wrap up in the next 10 to 15 minutes. One of the things um, that, uh, you know, this, this, is, this is from a paper that I had written a couple of years ago, but one of, the, one of the things that I wanted to point to was I kind of saw that there were two kinds of things happening in decolonization discourse. One, which was where I think most of the, most of the kinds of um, scholarship being produced hap is happening in the left-hand side, right? Um, and this was, you know, all these collectives that I've kind of pointed to depatriarchizing design, decolonizing design, BIPOC design history, et cetera. Most of them are working in this kind of space of what I would call like philosophically like a negative argument, which is that um, indigenous histories have been missing. Black histories have been missing. These are all things that have been pushed to the margins or have vanished or have been rendered invisible, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to bring, we need more representation. 
right? So, uh, you know, part of the, the argument around representation comes from that kind of discourse, right? Other ways of learning have been marginalized, other histories of design practice have been erased. Um, you know, one of the arguments in education is that indigenous or African American or immigrant students can't find themselves in the courses that they study, right? In schooling, in education. Um, and that there is systemic violence in the modern sort of like American university um, against these students, right? So these are all negative arguments. And a lot of these collectives are working in that range. I don't really want to talk about that. I will talk about the other side, which is the right-hand side. I saw one of the things that I'd identified was that there was another way of thinking about decolonization, which was not necessarily about addressing the past right, and the lack of presence in the present, but about thinking about the future. And this is kind of like, uh, you know, it, when I think about it, it's a little odd that like I started my career with like a critique on speculative design and I've kind of ended up talking about speculative design. But one of the things that, um, you know, I, I think I was really strongly, uh, this was work that I was doing both over the course of my PhD and subsequently like I've been working on for the past couple of years, was I was thinking like how can we rethink and create new practices of design that draw from both pre-colonial as well as present non-Anglo-European knowledge systems. So in other words, for example, um, a lot of my work, uh, you know, uh, I think two years, up until two years, one and a half, two years ago was, was, I was looking at gift economies in South Asia, in India. And, you know, one of the things that I was really interested in was like, how does a different understanding of the gift lead us to design service, services, service platforms and services differently? There's a really interesting kind of essay by the design scholar Clive Dilma called The Gift, um, which I'll write down his name here. Um, Clive Dilma, so it, you know, the, he wrote this essay called The Gift. And this essay is considered to be one of the kind of seminal works on gift economies in relation to design, modern design, 20th century design. Um, and, you know, Clive draws, in writing that essay, he draws a lot from, like, the kind of anthropological work that was done on gifts. Like, he, one of the people that he draws on is Marcel Mauss, right, who, who also wrote this book called The Gift. Um, you know, he was, he was one of the first anthropologists to write, like, a very uh, a consistent treatise on the gift. Um, you know, he writes about potlatch and sort of, like, Pacific Northwest uh, sort of indigenous communities and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, in response to Clive, uh, I was really interested in this question of like, well, if we were to think about the gift not from a, a, an, an, an Anglo-European perspective, but from an Indian perspective. So I, I had to go back into like both like uh, historical and Indian religious texts. Particularly, I was looking at the gift in the, in the context of like Vedic texts and scriptures and looking at the work that like historians and anthropologists in India had produced on gift economies during the Vedic period. Um, and so, you know, I was trying to get to this idea of like how does a completely different understanding of the gift lead us to think about designing differently? So I was far more interested in this kind of speculative work, like how do you study other cultures from within in order to then rethink practices today, right? And come up with new forms of life and new forms of practice. So in other words, like I was kind of interested and this kind of like puts together the Tony Fry bit about ontological designing, right? If all designing is ontological designing and all designing is futuring and defuturing, how do we make sense of what we have designed ourselves into? And you know, like that was the kind of principal challenge. And then how can a reimagined practice of design help bring forth new practices, new forms of life, and new worlds that are local to communities other than what we get from, you know, uh, mainstream or status quo design, which is largely, you know, is Anglo-European, is capitalist, um, and so on and so forth. So I was thinking about decolonization as a speculative practice um, of, of imagining designs otherwise you know, this is some of the work that I, I and you know, I've, I've talked about this and I've shown this in, uh, several times, but this was kind of where I ended up with the gift. Like one of the things, for example, that's really interesting about the Vedic conception of the gift, or the, and I must say that not, it is not 
politic, you know, just to make sure that politically it's put into its right context. This is a Brahminical upper caste perspective on the gift economy. There were other forms of gift economies in amongst the lower castes, and depending on whether you're looking at North India or South India, you know, regionally also conceptions of the gift vary. So this is a very specific kind of version of the gift. One of the things in, in the Anglo-European canonical literature on the gift, gifts are supposed to be reciprocal. I give you a gift, you are obliged to give me a gift back. This is what we also call in philosophy the paradox of the gift. So like for example, the, the French philosopher Jacques Derrida um, and other, you know, subsequently a student also Jean-Luc Marion who have written about this, right? But Jacques Derrida, one of the things that he points to is that he says that the gift engenders a, a, a paradox or what he calls an aporia, right? The fact there is no, a true gift is impossible because any gift has an obligation attached to it. But in India, this was never the case. In India, the gift is always non-reciprocal to begin with because the gift, when you give a gift, the, 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 don you know, the person receiving the gift has higher status, social status, than the person giving the gift. The entire social relation is reversed. Right, and so accepting a gift, you know, it, it, it's linked with kind of like the expiation of sin. Like if I'm giving a gift, I'm kind of relieving myself of a burden. And there are strong associations between the gift and the sacrifice in India. But it's a completely different way of thinking about the gift. Um, and so this was the kind of practice that I was interested in. The other thing that I'll say is that what I was also interested in is uh, was um, looking at new movements in art and design, like what you would call like revolutions or flowerings of creative practice at different points in time. One of which, and I've given a lot of examples here, I was really interested in the birth of Afrofuturism and sort of like the, uh, I was looking at specific points in 20th century African American history, uh, you know, um, like for example, the Harlem Renaissance and then the birth of Afrofuturism. Uh, you know, to kind of think about what goes into a flowering of kind of alternative speculative thought and imagination. And one of the things, and I, uh, I've just put in a quote um, from his book, Anthropologies of Revolution, you know, that I was also reading about, uh, one of the things that really struck me, I was reading this book by Martin Holbrod, who was an anthropologist, and he wrote something that really kind of spoke to me when I was looking at all this other work uh, that's Dina Danger, by the way, and you know, that's Sun Ra. Uh, is anyone here like a fan of Afrofuturism? Yes, yes, okay, good. We have a lot to talk about, okay. Uh, so, you know, um, Holbrod, you know, says this thing in his book where he, uh, and it really kind of jumped out at me when I read it, which was, any revolution is always a cosmogenic event in the sense that a revolution is not simply just a political uprising or a political kind of overturning. It is actually, cosmogenic in the sense that a revolution can only come out of a community that is envisioning an entirely different way of being in the world. So revolutions are inherently a new kind of worlding is happening. They are attempts, whether successful or unsuccessful, or frustrated attempts, to realize an entirely different kind of world and that there is an element of speculation and imagination in every, that is the seed of every revolution. Um, and this was really important, um, you know, to me, uh, I kind of then began looking at history uh, and at the kind of history of the Americas, um, you know, the Spanish and Portuguese colonization of the Americas and looking more closely at the kind of things that were happening. And I'm almost about at the end, uh, you know, this is, this is work that is currently presently I'm working on, so it's a little fresh. Uh, I haven't actually presented on it before. But um, I've kind of been revisiting, you know, uh, how, uh, the, I've been doing two things, which is I've been looking at the history, particularly the 19th century in Latin America, and more specifically in Mexico. So I've been looking at Mexican history over the 19th and early to mid 20th century. And I've been looking at sort of like how colonization changed, um, you know, conception of the, you know, how sort of like the caste system, a caste system was kind of like, um, you know, a racial, you know, the, the origins of race lie in the kind of institution of the caste system in Latin America. 
Um, so I, I was looking really closely at the way that cast operates in the Americas and the ways in which it then changed the kinds of socio-technical milieus, uh, you know, and kind of then led to early capitalism, you know, or proto-capitalism. Um, but one of the things that I've been paying a lot of attention to, both in this kind of like history, is looking at histories of independence and revolution. So I've been looking at a lot of work that is being produced by philosophers and thinkers, social thinkers, um, at the time. Uh, this, is, this is from er, the early 20th century. Um, most of the Mexican philosophers and thinkers that I've been reading hail from the late 19th, early to mid 20th, early 20th century. Um, these are all people who are effectively after Mexico, uh, you know, this is after the Mexican Civil War, um, you know, they are thinking about what it means to be Mexican. So they're thinking about questions of identity, questions of culture, uh, you know, what it means to be modern, so questions of modernity. Um, and, you know, two people, two of the scholars that I will very quickly talk about before I end my lecture, um, you know, so I, Jose Vasconcelos uh, wrote La Raza Cosmica, which is a very kind of contentious text uh, in Mexico, uh, partly because it has raised debates about whether the text is like racist or not. It, it has an essentialist view of race or not. Um, you know, the interesting thing about Mexican thinkers in the early 20th century is that they're thinking about identity in this very kind of futural and speculative way in the sense that they're thinking about the what the possibility of being Mexican is. So it's a really kind of odd move where they think about the, the possible self, the futural self, um, you know, their, their, their sort of formulations of identity are futural formulations. So La Raza Cosmica, for instance, you know, talks about how Vasconcelos imagines that there is going to be a final race. And it's, it, we can discuss this in greater detail over dinner perhaps, but like there's a very kind of nuanced sort of, one has to do a very nuanced reading of it because part of the critiques of his work are that he kind of delves into a kind of racial essentialism, right? But what, what, what I think is really interesting is that he's imagining the creation of new, uh, new people, a new kind of race, the cosmic, what he calls the cosmic race and the final race. And he imagines that this transformation is largely in terms of aesthetics. So one of the interesting things about that time period and the kind of social thought in that time period is that it is very heavily tied to thinking about art and aesthetics, right? Um, the connection with art and aesthetics is actually much more clearer in Edmundo Gorman's work. He wrote this essay in 1960 called Art as Monstrosity. And he, again, he's trying to think about what Mexican art can and should be with reference to pre-colonial Mexican artifacts, right? So there's this essay, there's a, there's a long kind of like portion of the essay where he is gazing upon in a museum this figure of the Mexican goddess Cuatlacue, right? And he's, he's asking himself like, this is a completely monstrous kind of ent entity. And it's monstrous not in the sense, not merely in the sense that according to European standards of beauty, it is ugly, but it is also monstrous because it represents a kind of hybridity. It is not like the chimeras of Greek myth. So he actually does this move where he compares the kind of Mexican artifacts, right? Uh, I won't call it artwork, with the kind of, with Greek sculpture and fine art. Um, and one of the things that he says is that Mexican art embodies this conception of the monstrous as that which is irreducible and that, you know, it acts as the kind of limit to Anglo and European reason. It is not art that can be reasoned with or made sense of. So there's that. And then I've been looking also at British colonialism in India and the caste system. So comparing the kind of the, the you know, the caste in, in sort of Latin America with caste in in sort of India, and very interestingly, uh, you know, uh, how the British, this is kind of well documented by Indian historians, caste as the way that we understand it in modern India today and in the world today is actually not how it originally was. Caste is actually a British construction. It's a British colonial category, right? Uh, what you had actually in India were two different concepts called Varna and Jat. Right? And the British, because they didn't quite understand how the, the fluid those 
those, those two concepts were also pretty fluid. But because the British, British historians and ethnographers at the time didn't understand how those two concepts actually operated socially, they kind of lumped them together and gave it the name of caste. And then that became the basis for like the, the British census and kind of British administration. There's a really interesting history about the links on the one hand between caste and biopolitics, the, the kind of largest sort of biopolitical experimentation uh, which happened under the auspices of the British Raj in the late 19th century. On the other hand, there's some very interesting kind of relations between caste and technological adaptation and adoption, which I'll talk about in a little bit before I end. But one of the things that the caste system is kind of also tied to is that it led to a very different place. And I think this is something I want to underscore. The colonial experience and colonial history is different for every context. So one has to kind of read against that. In India, um, the local elite, the British basically used the caste system in order to create an entire bureaucracy, which was largely actually manned by Indian elites um, and by new social classes, right? Like the Babus, for instance. Um, and so I kind of want to end with two things. Um, you know, I've been looking at this concept of caste, I've been comparing it with Mexican caste, but I've also been looking at thinkers and philosophers at the time of independence. These are also thinkers and scholars who are thinking about caste in relation to technology and thinking about it in relation to revolution or independence. So I'm kind of busy, you know, tying all these threads together. And I'll just end with Rabindranath Tagore and Gandhi. Uh, you know, Tagore was a uh, Bengali Renaissance man. He was a philosopher, he was a poet, he was an educator, he was many things. Um, in South Asia, you find this kind of, on the one hand, you find this weird, these two positions which, um, you know, I've taken this, these words from Shahab Ahmed, who is an Islamic scholar, but you find this ambiguity and ambivalence towards technology. So on the one hand, in Tagore's writing, um, he is ambivalent in the sense that he believes that India, that India has something to offer the world and that our, you know, like South Asian Indian ways of life are actually something that are aspirational, right? Worth aspiring to instead of, he's very critical of westernization in this sense. On the, on the other hand, there are, there are parts where both Tagore and Gandhi over here uh, you know, also say that, you know, technology is not universally bad. The problem isn't technology. The problem is the kind of underlying culture, cultural perspective and cosmology, right, that puts technology to specific uses. So Gandhi too was in, in places like in, in, his, in his text Satyake Prayog, which is a text that he has written, he's very critical of technology, of, of, of typewriters in general, right? Um, Actually, in Satyake Prog, he's, 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 he's pro typewriters in other texts, like there are letters of his that he wrote to colleagues. He's very critical of typewriters. So, you know, they kind of, uh, you, this, this very interesting, I think, thing where like Indian, Indian sort of like key thinkers um, are, are kind of ambivalent on the one hand. They also recognize the ambiguity of technology, which is that one thing can be used in many different ways and that technologies can be adapted to many different ends in different cultural contexts. Um, and you kind of have to, you know, read kind of deeply into their writings. Um, the last thing that I'll end with, because I kind of promised I'd talk about this was, and this is specifically regarding the typewriter, it's kind of wor worth noting that like, um, the typewriter, the use of the typewriter in India was very heavily kind of mediated by the British reading of caste uh, and of the Indian cultural, uh, Indian culture and society in general, right? So in the, in the late 19th, very early 20th century, you have a lot of, it's interesting that there are, and, and Gandhi himself hired European women to act as stenographers and, and typists for him. But when he moves to India, he kind of disavows this practice, right? He, he forbids Indian women from using typewriters. So European women can continue to use typewriters. The other thing to note is that the British, largely the most stenographers in, in British India were hailed from like the upper caste, the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas. The reason for this being is that the British had a very rigid notion of which caste could do which kinds of work. So the Brahmins were smart, they could do smart kinds of work. And so they were largely employed as clerks, 
and largely employed as like what would later become the Indian middle class, essentially middle class professions, upper middle class professions. Anyway, I will end there. I have taken up too much time. I always tend to go over, and my apologies for that, but uh, you know, I hope some of this was interesting. Thank you. Sure. We can also just have a discussion. It doesn't have to be. It could be comments, observations. Yes. Thank you. That, that's, a, that's a great question. It's a question about teaching. It's a question I actually love because it's about teaching. Um, so when I teach this, and, and there are, you know, um, I think, so there's a couple of things. I think in my teach, a lot of this has to do with my, the way that I teach. Like I teach this elective, which is essentially at the intersection of critical discourses on decolonization from other fields as well as design. And one of the things that I, I, I hope to furnish for students is to actually get them to start thinking from their own situation, situatedness, right? Like we're dealing with some very core questions I tell them at the very beginning of semester. And the other thing I will say is that I've kind of rushed you guys through a lot right now, but like, you know, when I teach this, I, it takes a long time, right? Um, so I teach much more slowly too. But one of the things that I always tell them is look, one should never accept as given fact any kind of claim about culture or society, or for the, and even for that matter, decolonization. De how you define decolonization and what it means for you politically and for your community and from where is, is dependent on where you're from, right? Like I'm, I'm originally from, I'm from Pakistan and I'm an immigrant in the US, I'm not a citizen, right? I have a certain kind of, I have a certain place here, I have a certain place there. There's a history there and there's a history here, right? I have to find the answer. Like the, an one should, I have to find the answer for what a decolonial practice and politics would be, drawing from my own situatedness and my own kind of the, the larger historical background. Now I can be inspired by, and I am inspired by, which is why like I do research on Mexico and and you know, African American history and all that. I can be inspired by and I can learn from the practices and the activisms of others. But I am also aware that there are times when what I want and what my, where my society is going, you know, like um, may not, may sometimes be at odds with or be, have frictions with, you know, what others desire and other communities desire. And in a multicultural cosmopolitan society, like the United States, like we have today, right? I think our task is to find ways to actually understand and navigate those frictions and learn to work in ways that are, you know, um, I'm not saying get rid of the frictions, but I'm saying we need to kind of learn to live together and cohabit together. You know, there's something really interesting, um, what, and this is something that, you know, uh, when I tell students, they're like, uh, well, we, you know, this never occurred to us, but. Like for example, um, there's this beautiful book um, actually that I would recommend called Otherwise World. Um, you know, uh, Janelle Navarro and Tiffany Masabo King co-edited it. it it's, a, it's a collaboration between a Native American and an African American scholar, right? And they're working about, they're, they're trying to ask this question, like Native American people have had their land stolen. They have been the victims of genocide. They are interned. They, in encampment, they are effectively, they're, they've lost their sovereignty, they've lost their land, they've lost their way of life, 
right? And they are effectively now living in a settler colonial state. For them, what they want, one of their goals, one of the goals in Native American activism is the repatriation of land. They want their land back. The best example of this is in that essay, that really popular essay, um, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor by, by Tuck and Yang. Right, where they say that decolonization for us means the, get a, give us our land back. That is the only thing that it can ever mean. We want our land back, right? It is our land, and it was stolen from us. Now that goal, which is a political goal, and it is a, you know it is the the, the kind of heart of, of, of indigenous activism in this country, right, and in Canada too, um, you know, in settler colonial states. It's completely at odds. Now one can ask the question, well, where does that leave African Americans? Right? Where does that leave African Americans? Where does that leave immigrants like me? I read Tuck and Yang's essay and I can't help but think like, but my goals are different. I mean, if, it, you know, and uh, Tuck and Yang also do this thing in, the, in their particular piece on it where they say that like, we will decide what to do with all of the rest of you once we have our land back. We cannot decide that now. But I think the otherwise world, like the conversation between King and Navarro is actually a, a, a much more interesting conversation because they are trying to find, despite this friction, right? Like we want our land back, but you are also here and you were brought here against your, you know, you were brought, you were enslaved, you know. So it's an African-American scholar and Native American scholar having really hard conversations. Um, and that's where I want my students to be. I want them to be like, I want you to firstly build an understanding of the world and of your reality that is nuanced, right? Just because someone is telling you decolonization should be this and you should be doing this, you should actually, you know, it requires a lot of self-education. A lot of what I do during the semester is precisely this, where I spend like, we, we actually from class to class, I slowly build this up. Right, where, I, where we spend actually a number of classes workshopping these things. We move from, for example, like thinking about identity critically, um, and then we move to thinking about like situating identity in these longer historical discourses about modernity and culture. Like there's this long, huge argument, right, around the question of culture. Is culture coherency and continuity, or is it hybridity and fluidity and change? What is it? We live in a globalized world, you know, I mean, glo people who talk and write about globalization and most post-colonial theorists talk about like hybridity, you know, like in fact, uh, David Graeber, the anthropologist who just, you know, died last, last year, I think. Yeah, I think he died last year. You know, he, he just recently posthumously his book, The Dawn of Everything was published. And one of the principal arguments that that book makes is that culture is never fixed. Cultures only develop, cultures are, culture is this fluid thing that is always relational. Cultures evolve and develop together. They are always in relation and they should always be read in relation to one another. There is no such thing as a fixed cultural identity. So, you know, and obviously like politically we're seeing the opposite, right? We're seeing all these arguments about what American identity is and what Pakistani or Indian identity, that's, not, that's the nationalist form of culture, right? So you have all these definitions about culture, modernity, difference, et cetera. So we have discussions around that, we workshop around that, and then eventually I bring them to design. So, you know, after we've spent a few classes building these things up and getting them to think from their own perspectives, then eventually I say, okay, now let's bring all of this design history in. And so now we'll open up the discussions to think about design and technology and socio-technical milieus and you know, the, the relation between technological change and social change and cultural adaptation. Um, I don't know if that completely answers your question. But yes. That's a very interesting and very hard question. Could you repeat, could you maybe repeat the question? Because I don't know if everybody So uh, I, I believe your question was, how does this discourse translate into concrete design 
tangible things that designers can do, including strategies and so on and so forth. Am I? Okay. Empathy and respect. So, uh, I, I mean, I didn't spend a ton of time on this, but if I go back, like there's, so there are a lot of different approaches. Maybe I'll speak to a few, right? Like Tunstall, Dory Tunstall and Norm Sheehan's respectful design, right? So there are all these design practices or approaches that have come out, developed, right? Like, so respectful design is about, largely focuses on two things, which is, um, upholding indigenous knowledge, right? So the task of the design researcher is, is not to act, you actually act as a sort of facilitator and you are there to learn. It's, it involves a different kind of stance. I also believe that it requires a different kind of methodological training. So um, there's, a, there's a great book that's been written by Linda Tohawe Smith called Decolonizing Methodologies, which is all about how to do actual field work, qualitative field work, like um, ethnography, with um, indigenous peoples. Um, if you want, she, she has two whole chapters on methods, right? Um, but that's, that's separate. I think Norm Sheehan and, and, and Tunstall's approach focuses very much on like the design researcher kind of gives up their status as the expert in order to become a listener. And it's, it's, a, it's actually, interestingly, you could compare it to participatory and co-design practice, you know, rather favorably. I think that's kind of where things get interesting. Um, but you know, with the intent of trying to understand the indigenous knowledge of a particular community and group, and then working with them to find out how that indigenous knowledge can inform designs that are not harmful. And in some versions of that application, like in, I didn't show his work, but Tristan Schultz, who was a colleague of mine in Australia, he does a lot of work on this. He does a lot of work on like working with indigenous communities in Australia to map their knowledge, right? He builds all these huge diagrams. If you look at his work, these maps of like what their knowledge, how they think about, for example, like their local environment and so on and so forth. Like basically putting that knowledge on paper, um, you know? And, and then the other thing is that acting as a mediator between whatever institutions the community is engaged with and the community itself. So it's kind of like as the designer, you're the person sitting in the middle who's acting as not facilitator on one side and mediator on the other, right? In favor of the community. Sasha, uh, Sasha Costanza and the Design Justice Group, again, like they have a very kind of like social justice centric approach. So they're, you know, they're, oh, uh, I'll write all these notes down, sure. Um, so yeah, the people, uh, okay, so you should look at their work, just Google their work. Um, so Tristan Schultz is working with Aboriginal communities in Australia. He does mapping. So if you want to look at his maps, um, he, and there are YouTube videos where he's talking about his mapping work, right? He's a designer slash artist who works with indigenous communities. Um, who else was I talking about? I was talking about Tristan's work. I was talking about the, uh, Sasha Costanza Chalk's work. Sasha Costanza. Right, so a lot of what they do is they're kind of like, uh, you know, it's all about democratizing and the design practice being as inclusive as possible, as many voices and perspectives in a room. Um, other work, there are other approaches, like for example, Dan Dana Abdullah, you might wanna check out, she's a graphic designer, so I'll write her name down too, you can look at her work. Dana Abdullah. Right, um, she was one of the first people to start like a regional magazine that was dedicated to Arab graphic design. So Kalimat, which was the magazine that she founded, co-founded, um, Kalimat was essentially like documenting graphic design coming out of the Arab world, the Middle East. Um, and in fact, there was a recently, just recently, I haven't gotten a copy of it, but I, I found, you know, like there is apparently now there's a whole history book on Arab graphic design like a history of Arab graphic design. I, I still to get a copy of it. I don't have a copy of it, unfortunately. Um, you know, so there's, there's lots of, you know, uh, up, like one way that design, you can think about design practice is uh, this pre precisely this kind of like historicizing, writing about design happening in other parts of the world, 
highlighting that work, bringing it to the attention of the international design community. Um, the work that I tend to think more about is speculative design. So the, uh, what I described was essentially like, you know, I like doing research on knowledge systems. M my own kind of approach to thinking about indigenous knowledge is slightly different. I'm more interested in like, how can indigenous knowledge help us rethink practices in modern 21st century capitalist societies? And you know, there's, there's, a, there's another kind of strand that I kind of pull from um, which comes mostly from people like Marilyn Strathern, who's also an anthropologist, you know, where they make this point. There, there's, a school in anthrop there, there's a school of scholars, anthropologists, who basically say that the point of anthropology is not to understand and describe the other. The point of anthropology is to study the other so that the other can act as a mirror to yourself. You become aware of your own weirdness, in other words. Right, like you know, like colonial in colonial times, this is what people, this is what colonizers used to do. Right, they used to say, "Oh well, look at their society; it's so weird. They don't think the way they do. They they don't do things the way we do." The whole point of, of ethnography is so that you become precisely aware of how weird your own kind of like way of doing things is. Um, Michael Tussig is actually someone who's written about this a great deal. He's done research in like um, South America. Right, where he talks about even in the modern day, how like for example, um, tin miner, you know, miners in Bolivia, for example, have all of these ideas about money. You know, there's there's a chapter that he's written um, in um, uh, the name of the book is completely. The, um, I'm forgetting which of his books it was, but there's 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 a there's a chapter that he's written on sort of uh, Bolivian miners where he talks about how they believe that like if you work for like a Western corporation, the money that you basically get, right, the salary that you get is somehow tainted and that it will effectively like cut your life short. Um, so there's some really interesting kind of ethnographic studies done about like how people even in, in today's world kind of think about capital and money and have these c critiques, right? One of the things that he says is that they think about money as tainted precisely because it is money that has taken away from the land. So they have a different ecological relationship. And from that ecological relationship, they have a different way of valuing the res resources, land resources. And for them, money is something unnatural. It doesn't come directly from the land. It is an abstract, it is an abstraction that makes no sense. Um, I don't know if that completely answered your question, but. Who is that researcher? Michael Tussig. The book's name was The Devil and Commodity Fetishes. South America. Um, Michael Tussik. He's also written a book on color, by the way, which is fascinating reading for graphic designers. So we're at 7.35. Do you want to do some more questions? Sure. Okay. If, yes. Mm-hmm. 
So, uh, I mean, I'm here right now, so that's saying, oh. like, it's happening right now, but I'm just wondering what you see. No, I think, you know, um, and part of why I was putting up that history, I mean, it's not ancient history. It's the history, lar largely, a large part of it is the history of the last five or six years or so. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm really happy that schools and students and teachers and researchers are thinking actively and that they're, on the one hand, I'm very happy that there has been a mainstream because, you know, 10 years ago, it wasn't like anyone was actively, you know, thinking about these things. Um, and it's not just the politics of race or culture, also the politics of gender. Like you would be shocked at how blatantly sexist some of the forums, you know, like that we were also on, which we partly in reaction built these platforms to. Like a lot of the people who are part of these collectives now were disenchanted with the system and with the status quo. So on the one hand, I'm really happy that that work that all of these people and these collectives and groups did, you know, it, you could kind of call it a kind of activism within the academy. I, I'm glad that that bore fruit because, you know, just over the last two years, I've been in countless presentations, conferences, symposiums where, you know, the fact that like the Design Research Society, which is the single largest design research organization in Europe, is now has a the, one of the largest special interest groups that is dedicated to these discussions. I mean, do I feel like they're the most radical? Probably not. You know, on the one hand, I'm kind of like, yeah, it's been mainstream, but I feel like with the mainstreaming, there has been a lack of nuance, which often happens, right? Because certain discourses get take control. They, they, they become prominent and they become foregrounded and everyone kind of follows them. And also, like, you know, I think part of that is, is a field problem, which goes back to my earlier, like, design theorists and historians are rare. Design practitioners are more common, right? And I feel like that gap, that lack has contributed to certain, you know, it's people like me who have to constantly then step up and say, well, actually, wait, you're talking about decolonization this way, but you could also think about it this way. And there are all of these nuances in terms of context, in terms of history, all these things that I want you to think about before you begin to practicing something, you know? So I can feel like partly it, it's, it's a larger issue, which is I would like, if you ask me what I want for design education, I would say every design program in the, in, in the world should have a design studies, fa dedicated faculty for design studies and a design studies, part of the curriculum should have that kind of theoretical work. And every program should have a design historian or two, right? And there should be, you know, like we don't learn about history in design schools. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of um, like even where, where I teach and I'm very aware of this, like people don't read, un unless you're in a master's or a PhD program, you don't read Papanek or you don't read, you know, like um, Kirkham, for instance. Why? You know, I think that these people should be read um, and I think that this should become a part of education. But these are large structural issues. Um, in some parts of the world, they've, I think, been better. Like Australia, the Australian university system mandated that design faculty, all of them should train and get PhDs from uh, some other field. And now they've mandated like that the universities have design studies as a backbone. In Canada, that started happening. There's a lot of job postings like, oh, we need a but you know, it's also this classic case of like, there's too few people and I think there's actually weirdly enough more jobs than there are people. But they're also hiring from adjacent fields like at science and technology studies. You know, like anthropologists have been hired. Like there's a lot of people filtering into design from other fields, particularly like the social sciences. Um, I don't know if that quite answers your question, but there's good and there's bad, you know? I will always say there's more nuances needed, but that's because I largely operate as 